Thanks, Alison. Um, thank you all for attending tonight. I know the weather is amazing out there and it's probably the last warm evening of the year, so I'm doubly grateful for you all coming along tonight. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for coming. And title of my talk today is where, it's from, where you're from or where you're at and how social determinants influence our health. So um, I work here in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences and I'm a lecturer in Epidemiology and Biostatistics and exploring uh, health inequalities has been sort of a theme of my research since my PhD onwards so it's something I'm very interested in so I'm really happy to be talking about this topic tonight as I'm usually teaching undergraduate statistics so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for a better reception tonight from you all. <laughs> So, because we're Loughborough, um, you know, we're kind of famous for sport and physical activity around here, I don't feel I can have any talk which doesn't mention <coughs> physical activity. So, when we're talking about it, we're talking about this idea of any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in a substantial increase in energy expenditure across above resting levels. So, it's this whole idea, I guess, about, you know, just quite unstructured activity, but maybe structured activity as well coming into it. So just sort of feel I have to start off with that one tonight. <laughs> so benefits of physical activity. I've noticed um, from a few of you, we've got quite a few public health people, we've got quite a few people from the school and across the university as well. So I imagine some of this is probably already quite familiar to you. But physical activity, if we were talking about it as a drug, we would, um, you know, and you could patent this, you would be a multi-billionaire. The evidence suggests that it helps us in a whole host of ways. You know, we've got um, evidence from dementia, maybe reducing the uh, prevalence, being able to contribute to reductions in uh, prevalence of hip fractures, or cause mortality reductions by 30% cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, colon cancer, depression, breast cancer, a myriad of different health outcomes, you know, really big health challenges that physical activity has been shown to contribute to reductions in. So it, it's a bit of an amazing area. Physical activity is, however, just one of many health behaviours and again, one of a multitude of different areas that contribute to our health. And actually, our health behaviours, as an overall fraction of what's contributing to our health, a surprisingly small proportion of what's going on here. Even surprisingly, I think every time I see these types of charts, I'm surprised again, you know, considering um, maybe how interesting the area is and how much um, of the research agenda seems to be devoted to it, areas such as genetics are, and how maybe you know, small in the overall scheme of things these areas are in terms of what is contributing to our health. Far, far larger, and I would argue maybe, you know, maybe less attractive to research, but still incredibly, you know, actually incredibly important these are showing, are areas such as our, both our socio-economic environment, and by that I'm sort of talking about a broad encompassing um, description covering areas such as social class, the income, levels of education, all these wider socio-economic determinants as well as our physical environment and what big differences these potentially make to our health. So physical environment, you know, talking about having safe buildings and safe areas to be in, um, as well as you know, safe workplace environments as well. So we've got these huge, um, we've got a huge array of different factors that we've got to be considering. And I know there's many of you tonight in public health, so what I'm saying is <laughs> quite bread and butter to a lot of you. But it's this idea that there are actually, you know, there are actually these huge, huge areas that are quite hard to, um, quite hard to study, but are really, really important to our health, and we should be studying them. So in terms of physical activity then, we see that, so we've 
talked a little already about how it can really help with a whole range of, you know, contribute to reductions in risk of disease, um, as well as all cause mortality. But this was from a study that was conducted um, and published in The Lancet, sort of just a couple of years ago now, 2012, um, which actually showed that some, there was quite a bit of variation between countries in how much physical activity was able to contribute to the disease risk. So on the uh, left axis of the graph there, we've got a statistic which is known as population attributable fractions. Or, and what it's, what it's really about is trying to explain how much of a disease risk physical activity would be able to uh, reduce. And we can see, and in this graph, the blue uh, blue bar chart refers to data from the UK and we can see therefore that in the UK compared to uh, the US which is pink, France which is green and the Netherlands which is orange, there appears to be a greater reduction that is possible in these particular uh, health conditions as well as all cause mortality. So we've got cardio, uh, CHD, so cardio um, sort of cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, breast cancer, colon cancer, and all cause mortality. Quite why that's, um, quite why there's differences between the country might boil down to some of the other factors that we talked about as well, whether there are differences, um, underlying differences in some of those other risk factors, those other determinants of health between countries. But that's um, certainly what this paper was able to show that you know, there seems to be um, potential for physical activity to make some really big um, contributions to reductions in disease risk in the UK. I should have said as well, I'm really happy to take questions throughout the talk as well. If anything is unclear or would like to, um, me to elaborate on anything, I'm very happy to. Okay, this next slide is again another uh, paper that came from Nature just last year actually, uh, 2017, where they did this really, um, which is really just illustrating that there's a lot of variations globally in rates of physical activity as well. So not only between um, sort of more developed and less developed countries, so uh, the graph here is indicating where the, um, is it's in a scale of steps and how many steps people are undertaking. It was a really novel study, this, where they actually had um, a, sort of an app that people could download globally. So it was thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they were able to monitor how many steps they were taking. So they were able to get this really big global picture of activity. I mean, there still might be you know, some problems about representation of who had this data. But it's really in, you know, quite novel in what they were able to do, um, harnessing technology that's becoming much more prevalent you know, worldwide, and so utilising these apps to get this data. And you can see, you know, see here, um, if the graph goes from blue being the highest levels of activity, so we've got um, countries such as China and Russia there that seem to have higher rates of activity, down to the red colour, which are the lower rates. So these, in this case, people taking about three and a half thousand steps per day. And you can see there are the nations um, such as Indonesia and, 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 and um, parts of Southeast Asia as well. I think that is um, Vietnam, but I might be slightly incorrect, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> um, and also some uh, parts um, of uh, North Africa there as well, I think. So, yeah, quite big variations that we're seeing globally in physical activity. So, what's going on currently in the UK? Where are we at with things, you know, despite... Um, I was actually surprised by this. I always think numbers are going to be lower than they actually are, but we're finding that at least 66% of men and 58% of women aged 16 and over, were actually meeting the aerobic guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous um, or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. What these, um, however, while this, you know, is indeed uh, quite positive, 
we can still see so 10% of the population from these studies are showing that, uh, that people are not even walking continuously for five minutes or more over four weeks. So we've got you know, huge variations um, in physical activity levels than within the UK, which is a concern when we consider <coughs> if we could optimise levels, what potential we would have to impact on health from that. In addition to variations um, you know, on a national level, we also see significant variations uh, in our inactivity based on different geographical regions of the country. So we can see um, that so Wales, particularly uh, Northern Ireland and parts of Northern England, have particularly high prevalence of inactivity compared to the southern regions of the UK. So really considerable, you know, considering we should all be more similar to one another, you know, we're not talking about these big global differences of great big cultural differences between nations, even within the UK, which, you know, fairly homogenous culture, we're still seeing these huge variations. So something, there's, yeah, there's, stories there which we still need to unpick to really understand why these variations are occurring. We're also seeing variations in activity by markers of social class. So NSSEC is a government-derived um, method by which people's <coughs> occupations can be used to grade them um, to create a social class gradient. So we have NSSEC 1 and 2 representing um, the sort of highest status jobs, white collar jobs, through to NSSEC 8, which um, represents people who are unemployed and so, you know, less economically active. And what we see here are clear gradients, both in inactivity with gradients, uh, with reduced levels of inactivity in those in the highest social strata compared to the lower social strata. And again, we see the same Gradient, but reveal rate, al 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 rate, rate of activity recorded in those um, in higher occupational status classes compared to those in lower occupational classes. So, again, this is giving us more of a picture than simply the geographic um, geographic differences. Also, these social strata that are contributing to differences in observed rates of physical activity as well, and therefore likely part of the explanation for differences in health. What was really interesting um, is this paper which I saw quite recently. Um, so I don't know if any of you, you might have come across this one as well, where there was some, so there's been a little bit of conflicting evidence sometimes about differences in physical activity level by sort of socioeconomic um, conditions. And what this study did, which went a little bit beyond um, some of the work that had been done previously, and it separated the results into different domains of physical activity. So if we think, we can think of physical activity as being, um, you know, something that we do as a leisure time activity, we could think of physical activity as being something related to a person's occupation, we could think of physical activity in terms of transport and, you know, how they're getting around, and also we can think... So sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, we can think of physical activity as something related to household activities, so maybe household chores, DIY, that side of things, so that we can think of physical activity as coming into these very different areas. And when you explore physical activity in this manner, you see a slightly different, um, you see a slightly different relationship with health outcomes. So what we saw that, you know, those first um, graphs that I produced showing that there are very clear differences with the amount of physical activity that you're doing and 
improved health outcomes. What this study did is show that maybe that is more down to the physical activity that people are undertaking as part of leisure time activities rather than, for example, occupational activities where we might actually see that there might be negative impacts of physical activity if it's taking place at, um, as part of their job. And I'll go on to explain that a little bit more, but um, you, know, you probably know the reason for that. But um, yeah, it's just quite interesting that more nuanced look at it and how some of these assumptions might need to change about how physical activity is best incorporated um, into people's lives so that it is beneficial to health. So health inequalities, what do I mean by this? So I like the definition that the World Health Organization uses. And they talk about this idea about there being an unequal distribution of health damaging experiences that's in no sense a natural phenomenon but is really the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies, unfair economic arrangements, where the already well-off and healthy become even richer, and the poor who are already more likely to become ill become even poorer and bad politics. So that's what I'm talking about, I guess, in this idea of being the unequal distribution of health between different, um, different people in the population. So this idea of there being regional variations in physical activity is also evidenced um, by regional variations in life expectancy in the UK. Um, so, and you see this in many countries. It's not something that's particularly unique to the UK, although where it is might differ. And you're seeing, um, so both the graph on the left represents results for women where uh, red represents areas that are worse than the English average, and green represents area that have uh, variations in life expectancy which are better than would be expected by average. <coughs> and you can see this clear north-south divide with us in the East Midlands somewhere in between. <laughs> So this interest in looking at health by, um, by geography is actually quite... The UK has an amazing tradition. It's fine, please come here. <laughs> <laughs> and I love... I, I must admit, it was something I learned about when I was training in epidemiology, and I love all these maps, and the UK seems to have just been such a leader in this area. And these maps... Um, were undertaken by Charles Booth um, back in the late 1800s. And he went around and mapped different areas of London by poverty. And just um, these always, I, I sort of have to laugh or you get upset by it. Um, but yeah, at this time, so, the, so we go from these black areas, which were the, um, the poorest areas, which at this time, Charles Booth decided to call them the lowest class, vicious and semi-criminal class. I'm not making this up. This is how it was described. So victim blaming of the poor seems to have been going on for some time. Um, through to the idea of the upper middle and upper classes wealthy um, in this kind of yellowy colour. I don't think we actually have any in this map. But so we've been looking at this idea of this whole idea of health in place for a long time. And what I guess what's kind of interesting of this, maybe the areas that um, poor people are residing and living in poor health have been changing over time. I'm sure if you look these days in London, I'd hate to think what these area, what houses in this area probably are costing. But it's health, health um, and place matter. Where you are living seems to, for an awfully long time, have been making quite a big difference to people's health. So it's also I find quite interesting this idea of, well, how did poverty come about? And I don't know, if any of you heard of Robert Sapolsky before? Um, he, he's great. I, I'll also mention a book of his later, but I think he's a really interesting author. And he talks about this idea, actually, of this poverty really sort of 
beginning, about the time that sort of coming hand in hand with agriculture. And this idea that people were able, therefore, to stockpile resources. And you would have unequal stockpiling of resources. So you have this time, and it invented a class between people who have things and people who don't have things. And thus this idea of agriculture being the thing that sort of allowed the invention of poverty. Quite interesting. So what do we see these days in the UK? So we have, on the left, we've got another measure of social stratification measure, which is done by area, which is known as the Index of Multiple Deprivation. Again, it's another government-based measure that um, has been produced for quite some time. It gets changed every now and again, but essentially uh, they utilise lots of information that's collected through things such as the census, and all areas in the UK are classified. And it's sort of a 10-point classification going from a most deprived to a least deprived area. And what we see in this graph is, again, this idea of a gradient. So we've got the green, sort of bluey green bars there, are referring to a person's life expectancy. And the red bars are referring to a healthy life expectancy. So not only are people in the least deprived, er uh, least deprived areas, they're living longer, they're also living in a healthy way for longer. In contrast to those in the most deprived group who are living um, you know, a shorter life, but also less of their life in a healthy manner. So you've got these dual things going on here. And what do we see more generally? This is um, showing, again, sort of the same information, really, but I just think maybe it's a little bit easier to see in this graph. And we can see here that um, with increasing deprivation, sorry, with decreasing deprivation, we're, we're spending more time in good health. So we're having this longer life and longer life in good health. These differences aren't just observed at the end of life. These differences are evident from birth. And they appear to have been so for quite some time. So what we're seeing in this graph then is uh, differences in birth weight. So why birth weight? Why is that so interesting to researchers? Well, birth weight is an indicator of development during pregnancy. And birth weight is in of itself an independent risk factor for many diseases in adulthood. So things such as cardiovascular disease, um, even, yeah, sort of in that cardiovascular, cardiometabolic health, strong risk factor is often for those children who are born um, smaller birth weight have increased risk of these adult cardiometabolic diseases. And we see in this graph that those born in the um, most deprived regions are most at risk of being born small, um, born at term but with low birth weight, as compared to those offspring of the least deprived families. So we see these again, you know, both stages, both when we're looking at what happens at the end of life and at the early life, um, we're seeing these these differences in health. So, have any of you um, encountered the spirit level? Yeah, I see <laughs> a few nodding faces here. So, um, I was very lucky to be supervised in my PhD by Professor Kate Pickett. Um, and her and uh, Richard Wilkinson have written a book, which I would yeah, strongly encourage if you haven't read it. It's a great read, known as The Spirit Level. And the whole idea of this book was sort of going a little bit beyond inequality, but within, uh, within regions, but actually looking at inequalities within countries. So what do I mean by this? So in this case, we're talking about the differences within individual countries between the poorest and the richest in those nations. So I apologize if this graph isn't terribly clear to those at the back, 
But this country that's up here at the top is the USA. At the bottom, we've got Japan, and to the bottom, um, also, we've got the Nordic countries, <coughs> Sweden, uh, Norway, and Finland. So we've got countries that have very different income distributions between them. So, you know, much... Some of these countries have more extreme levels between rich and poor compared to others. What this graph is showing us, then, we've got this idea of an index of health and social problems. And it's showing us that this gradient increases with increasing inequalities within countries. So there seems to be... And this is, this is in rich countries. They, they don't make any bones about, um, you know, this doesn't appear to be evident in um, more developing, uh, developing countries of the global south. But certainly in rich countries, we seem to see these gradients in um, more health and social problems in more unequal, unequally wealth-distributed countries. <coughs> this doesn't just seem to happen uh, for health outcomes, but also in terms of mental health outcomes as well. So again, um, here in the graph, we've got uh, countries, we've got Japan, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, and we've got US, the USA, closely followed here by Australia and the UK, having, uh, demonstrating this relationship between income inequality and mental health problems as well. What do we see in the UK? Well, UK is an interesting one because we have an NHS. Everyone, you know, has free health care at the point of contact. However, we still see when... So the uh, red graph there is um, physical and mental health comorbidities, so people who have both physical and mental health um, problems. The blue line at the top refers to standardised mortality, so it's sort of a mortality rate that's adjusted... Um, or underlying population structures. And what we have along the bottom in green is the proportion of consultations with health services. And so we can observe in this graph that despite having differential health needs, there's a very different way, um, you know, people are actually accessing her services at a really similar rate. So there's some disconnect, therefore, um, and also the black line, probably the most important, there's a disconnect between the funding that services are receiving who are looking after these populations that are experiencing many more health problems than others you know, that are um, in these areas. And I have, to, I have to sort of put my hand up and say, you know, when we're looking at deprivation by area, we do have to be careful because not all poor people live in poor areas and not all rich people live in rich areas, but there's more rich people living in rich areas and more poor people living in poor areas on average. So there are other things going on here, but it's an interesting, it's a very interesting um, observation which um, Julian Tudor Hart termed as the inverse care law, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. What's interesting as well, so not only have we got these inequalities in outcomes in terms of health outcomes, what we're increasingly seeing um, is as countries become more unequal, so too to the opportunities for people to get ahead by education within the countries. So education is always, you know, talked about as being, you know, the roots out of poverty, but there's something about these, something about the structure of these societies as they become more equal, more unequal. This seems to become less and less of a possibility. People are getting locked out. People aren't changing because I guess you know we went through this time where everyone was getting uh, wealthier than their parents before them. But this does seem to be stalling in some countries. So. What is it about these unequal societies? That, what, what is it actually doing to us biologically? Back to Robert Sapolsky again. Um, he actually... So we're not the only um, group that live in unequal structures. 
got some really, really interesting data from our nearest and dearest um, baboon troops. <laughs> So baboons live in really, really structured, dominant, hierarchical structures. There's a head baboon who gets the first choice of food, who gets the access to the ladies. He's living the good life, you know. <laughs> but over time, dominance gets challenged, you know. You can, oh, And then there's also the baboons at the bottom who get nothing. They get the scraps. They don't get the chance to... Uh, pass on their genes, you know, they're kind of a bit shunned from the group. <laughs> so what they find then is the baboons who are at the top, who get the best of the picking, who get to beat up everyone else, who get their choice of mates, they have better reactions to short-term stress. Because there's obviously, living in these sort of structures, there's a lot of fighting going on, as you can imagine. Everyone wants to be top baboon. But, you know, but they seem to be able to deal with things better. They just seem to have more resilience by being at the top. For those baboons, though, that are lower down the pecking order, this idea um, you know, of being chronically stressed, of being always the one who's kind of pushed out the way, who never gets to you know, have their choice in things, whether it's meats or food, leads to increases in stress markers. So same as the sort of things that you would expect to see in a human population. So things like blood pressure. I think they've even seen like arterial wall thickening. So these sort of early markers of cardiovascular disease. But they have found that for baboons, you know, even if you're a little bit lower down the tree, so life isn't so easy for you, if you have better social connectedness, so more friends, you know, someone to go and hug you when that mean, nasty, big baboon yelled at you and you can go run off. It does seem to be protective. So I think, you know, there's a lot of um, really interesting. It's Primate's memoir. I highly recommend reading it. It's a really great book. But there's a lot of parallels between what we, you know, sort of observing through cohort studies when we're looking at, at structures and how, you know, how both chronic stress can be harmful for us, but how um, social connectedness can be protective for some of these factors as well. So what else is going on? And from human studies, so there have been really, really interesting uh, work done in all sorts of different cohort studies. And there seems to be this idea that sort of living in these very chronically stressful environments produces quite a high, well, they term it this allosthetic load, but sort of thinking of it as a wear and tear. We get worn down by life. You know, being constantly subjected to different stresses, it's hard on our blood, on our blood, on our blood, on our blood, on our body systems. And when, you, and when you're thinking about humans and the complexity of life, when you're thinking about extra factors that might come into this, so, you know, thinking about things like traumatic life events, so, you know, possibly, um, you know, being abused as a child, losing a parent in an early age, all these, you know, very horrible things, particularly when you look at those in connection with your social position in society and therefore how, you know, what resilience you have around you, you can see how different people living in a different environment being exposed to similar stresses and, you know, um, you know, particularly if there are additional factors such as social isolation involved as well, so not having any social networks or support to go to can really lead to this, um, you know, constant impact and constant stress on your bio biological system and also obviously impact on mental health as well, as well as physical health. So this is sort of the theory behind what might be going on. And, you know, they have seen from cases children, children in Romanian orphanages who, you know, been left alone and in very abusive environment, you know, so the, you know, very, very extreme example of, of what might happen. They actually found... Um, you know, because some of them were removed at quite young ages, 
they still found really adverse effects on you know both their brain development and growth. They've been caused from um, you know being exposed to these very stressful, neglectful situations. You know, been isolated. So yeah, you know these horrible events have allowed you know some of these studies to really be undertaken. No one would ever want to um, study these things, but um, yeah. So, yeah, being poor is, um, you know, and being poor is expensive. <laughs> uh, you know, whether you're thinking about, so, you know, additional stresses that come with it, you know, think about utility bills, um, you know, if people are on meters, you're paying much higher rate per, you know, per unit of energy than somebody who'd be on a direct system, which when you're renting, you might be forced into a situation where that is all you can do. It impacts on people's ability to plan purchases. You know, the idea of waiting for the sales until you need a go you know need goods um, probably goes out the window when you're living week to week. Um, your ability to plan becomes harder. Um, access to credit is more expensive if you you know are on a low income. The rate of rate of repairs that you're going to be paying is harder. You don't get access to great bank accounts. Um, whether access to food is more expensive or not, I was looking into this today and it seems it's actually a little bit more controversial, but certainly the proportion of your income that you're spending on housing and food will be higher compared to somebody um, with more resources. Costs of society, um, you know, of inequality, it's, uh, again, it's expensive for all of us. Um, society has become more disaggregated. Um, Certainly, there are evidence that, again, um, there are more homicides in, as societies become more unequal. I guess this whole fracture in trust doesn't help with things. Um, cost of the NHS go up as you have more people in poorer health needing to access services. And as we saw, um, you, know, they con you know, higher rates of mortality, this lower life expectancy means we collect collect less tax as a society um, and overall you know we'll see lower educational outcomes as well associated with that so it's no good for any of us so what's needed to put things right so physical activity has a role to play in here but there's also you know I guess we need to be thinking about interventions that cover a whole range of areas, whether they, you know, of course, individual interventions are important, but also interventions that work to promote a better environment, you know, making it so that people can go out and exercise, um, you know, so it's safe for them. We want to think about, you know, protecting the natural environment as much as we can as well to keep that um, better. And we certainly see differences in access to green space often by deprivation, you know, just whether you're able to live in an area that's able to keep its parks or whether they've been sold off, sadly. So there's a lot that needs to be done at, you know, regional and national policy to address these issues. It can't all be down to individual behaviour change. And there's obviously, um, you know, at a global level, we need to be thinking about how we're, you know, allowing marketing to occur. You know, are we allowing certain, are we allowing, you know, bad things to, bad nutrition, tobacco, all these things to be pushed at people, um, you know, whether they should be or not. So, yeah, the corporates, corporate determinants are also incredibly important. Additionally, we've got to be thinking about what types of system-wide approaches are needed at different stages at the life course. If we're thinking about interventions, you know, to help um, things like birth weight, we've got to be thinking <coughs> almost preconception. So we've got to be, you know, targeting very different segments of the population. If we're worried about, you know, social isolation, how that might impact for, 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 for um, sort of younger age groups compared to older older groups. So I think physical activity still has a really huge role to play in this, despite it being one, it's one small part of the step. But we know physical activity, um, you know, plays a key role, particularly in early child development um, in research that I've done. You know, children who are able to move better 
it's just simple things. Um, you know, like are able to hold a pen better at school. And I work with a colleague in Leeds who's done amazing work looking at the links between all those sort of uh, development of early to engage, 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 to engage in education. I think there are real key roles to play in terms of improving social cohesiveness. You know, if you can get people mixing with different parts of the population maybe they don't get the chance to and physical activity provides one forum for that to happen and so you get more trust you know know more people in your community so yeah it's I also think there's a really good role in being able to provide neighborhood improvements and certainly like it's really interesting all the work going on in public health plan and some of you may be involved in this as well and how streets can be redesigned <coughs> So, you know, and areas can be redesigned so that they better so support the populations in them, not just the people whizzing through in a car. And that can help facilitate play and, um, and you know, even just improving the quality of neighbourhoods that people are living in so that, that, you know, just more pleasant places to be out and about. <coughs> There are some cautions that I do have, however, and I think you know there's a lot of work that we still need to do to be able to really sell the work in physical activity to sort of at a wider government policy level. One of the big issues that we have, and it's not unique to physical activity research um, whatsoever, but certainly we struggle to attract people who are more deprived into research studies. I haven't been involved, um, I've been involved in cohort studies before I came here to work in Loughborough. And so the groups that um, we, we have the same problem. Um, and so we're trying to produce evidence to improve things for people, but we're not engaging them in the research process. And that's a problem. <laughs> if we're trying to say, you know, what we should be able to do to help people, we're not cracking this bit and we've got to work harder. Reverse causation, so sorry, it's a bit of an epidemiology term. Um, I was trying not to use too many horrible terms, but it's this idea with a lot of the work, um, particularly if you're looking at uh, longevity research and physical activity, it might just be the people who are healthier anyway, um, you know, who are able to carry on and keep doing physical activity throughout their life. So we're not quite sure if it's the health that's contributing to someone's physical activity or the physical activity that's contributing to health. And so that's, it's a bit of an icky statistical issue that there are, we're on it, we're trying to work through this, but it, it, is, um, it does make things harder. There's also the very real possibility with a lot of research on interventions of physical activity that we could increase inequalities. That is, the interventions will work very, very well for those less deprived, less, you know, less deprived populations than for the most deprived, and so we make the gap bigger. And that, again, by not getting those most deprived people in our studies in the first place, we may be unaware of it. So I think there's a lot on the intervention development side that we need to work on to try and improve that. Um, and I think I, I was reading some lovely, I don't know if any of you have heard of Ollie Williams. Um, he's a qualitative researcher at Leicester, but he does a lot of work around um, the, the idea of stigma, and particularly with deprived populations. When we're thinking about, you know, even health promotion efforts, that we're not inadvertently um, sort of shaming people <laughs> And I think that's, again, um, I find his work very interesting. I want to read more of it um, to find out how we do those side of things better as well. So, and I guess the big area, sort of small line there, but we often need help. You know, we, we need help at a policy level from departments, you know, whether, you know, sort of other government departments, whether we're thinking about transport or or health, you know, there's a lot of other people we need to kind of bring along with us if we're really going to be able to improve things as well. So I'll just leave you with this slide. It's been quite an interesting... Um, there's a new cancer research um, 
policy. Some of you are smiling, you might have seen this one before. With these billboards, you'll probably see them popping up around town. This obesity is a cause of cancer. And indeed it is. Um, no one's disputing that. But if we're to tackle issues um, such as obesity, which impact on lots of other things, we've got to be thinking about the factors that underlie them. We've got to be thinking and trying to work on the poverty, the inequality, and the austerity. Um, simply putting billboards around without context, um, while it's true, just may not be the most helpful uh, way to frame this message if we're trying to um, reach out to people. So thank you. Thank you.